Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We are thrilled to have you join us for the sixth in our series of uh, virtual events that we are hosting this year to celebrate the Friends of the Texas Historical Commission's 25th anniversary. Our hope is that through these events, you will get to know more about us, the Friends, and our mission to support the Texas Historical Commission in its preservation efforts across the state. And hopefully you will choose to support us in these efforts. Uh, for those of you that have made donations um, uh, to the Friends, thank you so much for your support. Um, I wanted to also welcome other uh, uh, people that we, we know our friends, commissioners, board members, advisors, um, former board members who are with us today, um, as well as some of our colleagues at the Texas Historical Commission. Thank you all for taking time to join us uh, this afternoon. Um, I also want to introduce my colleague, Katie Kuckerbaum, who is the brains behind these events. Um, she is the one who plans them and, and makes sure we have everything we need to bring these fun events to you um, every month. Um, Reina Andrade, who is not with us yet, um, but who is the invisible force behind the scenes at the Friends. Um, she keeps us all doing what we need to do. Um, and then Hope Baron, who is our uh, social media expert, who has been reaching out to you via Facebook um, at THC Friends and on Instagram and Twitter at Friends underscore THC. Um, if you are on social media, please do follow us on these platforms. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you know about our next virtual event, uh, which is scheduled for uh, July 15th at 6 p.m. That's a Thursday. Um, we will take you at that time to the Fort Griffin State Historic Site to meet the official Texas Longhorn Herd. Um, we have herd manager, Dr. Will Craddock, who will show off part of the herd, and he will talk about the amazing history of the state herd and the Texas Longhorn cattle. There's a lot of history there, uh, along with the history of the Fort Griffin um, State Historic Site as well. Um, you'll enjoy stories of trail drives from 150 years ago, uh, from right where they took place on the Great Western Cattle Trail. And um, registration for this event is also open at www.thcfriends.org. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I introduce today's event and our presenters. Um, we would appreciate if you can keep your microphones on mute and your cameras on. We'd love to see your faces and have you engage in, in conversations with us. Um, as we go through the presentation, the first part of this event, um, I would um, request that you switch your viewing option to speaker view. Um, and you can do that by clicking the, the little view button on the top right corner of your Zoom screen. It'll give you the options, uh, pick speaker view. Um, that way you'll be able to see the, you know, the speaker in full screen uh, and it'll be a better uh, viewing experience. Um, we will start the presentation um, and have our presenters uh, take us through that. Uh, and then we have time set aside for question and answers, conversation, sharing if you all have anything that you'd like to share with us um, we'll have time for that as well um, if you uh, if you want you can put your questions in the chat box or you can uh, drop your name in the chat box and we will call you uh, and you can ask your question yourself or call on you brother um, it is now my privilege to introduce today's event and our speakers um, as you may know the friends of the texas historical commission's motto is preserving the real places and the real stories of Texas. Storytelling is key to the work of preservation. And like all of our historic site staff, our presenters this afternoon also combine their passion for their site and for the storytelling to bring you today's event. Um, I'll start with Amanda Lanham. Um, Amanda is the educator interpreter at the Eisenhower Birthplace State Historic Site. She came to THC right in the middle of the pandemic last year uh, in August. So she kind of landed into the world of, of virtual communications, virtual education, and, and just ran with it. Uh, but she has been in the museum field since 2014. Before coming to the THC, she worked at the Museum of the Coastal Bend in Victoria, Texas. Um, Amanda has received her MA in history from the University of West Florida and a BS in social science education from Florida State University. She is also a certified heritage interpreter and a certified interpretive guide trainer with the National Association for Interpretation. John Akers 
is the site manager for the Eisenhower birthplace and the Sam Rayburn House State Historic Sites. He moved to Denison to take on this position in 2012 and lives there with his wife and two children. John is a public historian, an educator, and a manager with over 20 years of experience working with museums and historic sites. In 2019, John was awarded the Moving Forward Giving Back Award by Denison Mayor Janet Gott and the Denison City Council for his volunteer service to the community. And I did wanna add that um, we have, uh, Katie and I both have the privilege of working with John uh, on a capital improvements project that is going on at um, Eisenhower Birthplace State Historic Site. Uh, I'm sure John will share a little bit about that too as he uh, goes through his part of the presentation. John and Amanda are coming to us this afternoon from the Eisenhower Birthplace in Denison. Uh, if you are in the area, if you live in the area or you're traveling in the area, please do go visit um, so you can learn more about the site and about the place where our 34th president was born. Again, please make sure that you're viewing in speaker view so you can see the demonstration well. And with that, Amanda, John, thank you both for taking time with us uh, to be with us today and for sharing your site and your stories. Um, it's all yours. Thank you, Anjali and Katie, and thank you everyone for attending. I'm uh, doing my part of the presentation from the kitchen of the Eisenhower birthplace. So the house that General Eisenhower and our 34th president uh, was born in. And I love this topic that we're talking about the beginnings of Dwight Eisenhower. But we're also looking into the world of food. And there's actually a lot of food history uh, related to the Eisenhower birthplace and, and, and General Eisenhower. And one of the books that we sell in our museum store, it's out of print, but we have copies of it. It's called Ike the Cook. So he did enjoy uh, cooking and it's full of recipes. He said he learned to be his own mess sergeant when he got married to have more variety with, with meals. But we're talking about uh, the early life of Eisenhower and about his parents. And so thank you. I want to share my screen and talk to you a little bit about the history of the Eisenhower birthplace uh, for you to give you a sense of where we are at today. And says it's coming online there. All right, so we tell the world, say the real places tell the real stories and we're telling the story of the Eisenhower birthplace. This is our brand image. General Eisenhower during World War II comes to the world view and the community remembers the family living in that house in a working class part of Denison, 30 feet away from railroad tracks and they are proud of it and they preserve the house. Uh, this is the house that I'm in right now. So this is a two-story simple frame house. Uh, I love his biographers like to say that Dwight Eisenhower was born in a shack by the railroad tracks. Maybe you're laughing, it doesn't really look like a shack. It was built in 1877 as a nice house on a hill that had a view of Denison's Main Street. But the year after it got built, it was a railroad was put in across the street from it. This house was made for the Texas environment. Uh, it's called the Carpenter Gothic style. If you look under the gables, the points, you might see that kind of scrolling woodwork. You'll see there's lots of windows with double hung windows. So to open those windows, the vent out the house, porches on two sides of the house. Uh, this is where they lived, but then a year, uh, they rented it for three years the year after the house was built though, it was across the street from railroad tracks. This is just a view of rails. The trains, the rails are not, the train tracks are not there anymore. But if you go and stand outside the house that I just showed you, you will see where we still have the corridor where the rails, the railroad ran. And part of that capital campaign, one of the things we wanna do is to rebuild a section of track and put some rail cars on it to give you the context. So we said, you know, he wasn't born in a shack, but how could they afford to live in this nice house while well, it was really close to the railroad, uh, which had 15 to 20 trains come through every day. And you could just imagine what that would be like, right? There's the noise you would have. Uh, the house is pure and beam construction, so there's no real foundation. It's sitting on the ground. So the house would vibrate. You can imagine this room shaking 
as the train goes by. And third, we're talking about big old steam trains burning coal where that, 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 that soot, that smoke would blow in the house. Uh, and so I like to think they got a break on the rent. And so we're talking about the birthplace of Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe during World War II. He commanded D-Day, the largest seaborne invasion in world history. We just had the 77th anniversary of that just on Sunday, the, the battle that he commanded. And so he was the face of the, Ameri of the war effort in Europe. And so you can see that the man who beat Hitler. Uh, after the war, people liked Ike and he was elected to two terms as our 34th president of the United States. But most importantly, he is the first Texas born president from, uh, of the United States. First US president born in the state of Texas of which there have only been two. And so, yes, there's four that have a Texas connection, but the other one born in Texas is Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, but Eisenhower was first, first Texas-born president of the United States. And he was born in Denison, Texas. And people say, I didn't, wasn't aware. They know he grew up in Kansas. Denison, if you put your finger on a map on Dallas and just go straight up to the Red River, that is where Denison is, is an important crossing point Today, it's uh, about 25,000 people. It has a main street. It's a main street community. So it's a main street program. And we're, they're great partners with us. So created in 1872, uh, it was, we call it Katie's baby, Denison. The Missouri, Kansas and Texas Railroad was the first railroad to come into Texas uh, from the North. I mean, there were railroads in Texas, but they weren't connected. The Katy built the bridge over the Red River, and you see a picture of that. And basically, they created Denison. Denison was named after a vice president of the railroad to be their kind of their entry point into Texas. And they were coming to put cowboys out of work. So we'll get into the, the food theme, right? We know about cattle drives. Denison is actually located on what was the Shawnee Trail. Well, if you bring the railroads here, you can get the cattle directly, put the cowboys out of work. So Denison became a boom town. Check out that steam engine. So think about 15 to 20 of those going 30 feet in front of the birthplace, you know, about one an hour, right? What that would have been like for that. Well, the railroad brought lots of people. Denison boomed very quickly. Uh, by 1890, it had 11,000 people. You see the main street. Check it out. They had a five-story building on Main Street. It's not there anymore. We actually have a cool picture in our visitor center of the, of the neighborhood with the birthplace. You can see it in it, taken from the top of this building. But what I'm saying was that it was a bustling place. There was money to be made from the railroads. And that attracted, brought in this family. Uh, this is David. Eisenhower and his wife, Ida Stover Eisenhower. And so these were Dwight's parents. And uh, David is from Pennsylvania. Ida is from Virginia. Their families independently moved out to Kansas where they met. Now, Ida, I love her story. Her parents died when she was very young. She later got some inheritance from her father, but she was with different family members and she kind of learned how to take care of herself. She learned to bake. She learned to sew. So when she was a teenager, she would hire herself out to different households as, as baking and cooking. So she learned how to do this. It was very resourceful, very independent, but they wanted an education and they met at this college called Lane in Kansas, fell in love and they got married in 1885. So this is their wedding photo, bad, badly colorized wedding photo. Uh, David tried his hand at running a general store in Kansas. Uh, wasn't a good time for doing that. So you know, he was in that kind of business. But uh, I like to say at the age of 26, he kind of had a midlife crisis and decided that's not what he wants to do. He uh, quit his job. They have a son at this point. Ida's pregnant with her second son. This guy needs a job. He's interested in, in mechanics and in, in railroads. So he ends up in, in Denison in 1888 to get take a job in the roundhouse that you see there. He was an engine wiper. It was an entry level mechanic. It was his job to lubricate the gears on the trains. Uh, he made maybe about $7 a week. 
you know, less than $500 a year, which even in 1890 was not very much money. This is located within 10 minutes, uh, probably a 10 minute walk from the Burr Place neighborhood. So he rented it, so he was able to go there, work six days a week, long hours, uh, working for the railroad. But this is what brought them to Denison seeking opportunity. People often ask us, well, how do you know that, that Eisenhower was really born there? This is the 1890s city directory. And in the directory, you'll see that I have it circled. Eisenhower, David J, Wiper, right? Okay, for the MKT shops. Residence, Northeast corner of South Lamar Avenue and Bay Street. So the family shows up. So during World War II, people, the community is like, yes, there's some proof. But there were people who remembered the family being there as well. Here's Denison in 1890. It's a bird's eye view map, a lot of detail, but this map is supposed to make you want to move here. It's a happening place. You see all the pictures of the buildings at the bottom, including that five-story five -story building, uh, third from the right. And at the top of it, you can see kind of some lines of railroads at the very top. And there's a neighborhood at the very top. So that's the railroads created the wealth of this community. And at the very top center, watch that space we have the neighborhood. And you see to the right, you can see kind of a, a square, a park, that's Forest Park. Next to it, we have the round house that his dad worked in. And you go a few blocks to the east in the red circle, you see a curved railroad track and the birthplace house is right next to it. So this shows you the neighborhood. It shows you it's isolated from Denison. Uh, so they had their own shops and general stores in that neighborhood, but that's a working class neighborhood that Eisenhower grew up in. This is his family. So when uh, Eisenhower was a year and a half old when the family moved back to Kansas. Uh, so here's David and Ida. I love Ida's expression. I think she had a very, very positive outlook on life. She had a big influence on her sons. Uh, they had seven sons in all, six lived to adulthood. The one in the center that looks like a girl's Milton. I guess mom wanted a girl. She didn't cut his hair yet. Uh, Eisenhower, Dwight is on the far left corner, not right next to dad. The two boys next to him, the tall ones are Edgar and Arthur, and they lived in the house that was here. Uh, when we did the restoration, not we, but you know, when the restoration happened in the 50s, the people who did that interviewed both men, uh, Edgar and Arthur, and Arthur talked about playing underneath the house in the, the crawl space. They also talked about occasionally if mom had extra money, she would wait for the tamale peddler to come by. So they remember there's a food thing again, tamales. Uh, all the, her sons were successful. They all went, all graduated from high school, five to six went to college. So she had a banker, a lawyer, and a general. Uh, she did not see him become president, but she knew he was a big deal. So here's the family. And this is what the house looked like about 1940 on the eve of World War II. Uh, so you see it. And what, what, what I want you to notice is there's a neighborhood. There's houses next to it. Today, you'll see this nice park. Uh, when he became president, the town made a park out of it and they moved the houses. So another thing that we're doing is the fundraising campaign is we're gonna put outlines of these houses around the site so you get the sense of the neighborhood that was there. And you see the streets aren't paved. So it's definitely a working class part of town. Uh, during World War II, when Eisenhower gets sent to Europe, he gets in the newspaper, he's on the radio, and this woman, here's his name. Her name is Jenny Jackson. In 1942, she's a retired school principal. But in 1890, look at the center photo, the woman on the left. She's a young school teacher, lives across the street from the Eisenhower house, and she visits with Miss Eisenhower and holds baby Eisenhower. So she holds Ike as a baby, and she remembers the family, and she starts writing General Eisenhower to confirm that he's from here, and he gets her in touch with his mother, who later on writes and confirms that, that Dwight was indeed born in that house in Denison, Texas. So she leads an effort for the community to buy the house. They buy it in January, 1946. Remember they're, they're, they're buying, they're raising money during war, during rationing. They get the money, they uh, buy the house and they invite Eisenhower to visit. And he comes on April 20th, 1946. We just had the 75th anniversary of that. This is the dining room right behind me over here. 
And uh, they had the, the newspaper said he had a big Texas breakfast in the house that he was born in. That meal that they're eating there was prepared in this space in the kitchen. Uh, if you visit the house today, there, it's a, you get amazing that they had that many people in that room. So there's General Eisenhower and the woman on the lower right hand corner, guess who that is? That's Jenny Jackson, the school teacher who held him as a baby and led the effort. So we celebrate this event every year, the big Texas breakfast uh, that took place here. The house opened up and uh, that, that was our birthday to open up to the public. Of course, when he became president, it was a really big deal. And then in the 50s, the house was restored. So lots of people coming through here. You can still see houses in the neighborhood. He comes back in 1952 and he's running for president. He's there with the, he, the woman next to him is uh, Monty Bells Jones, the president of the Gold Star Mothers, women who lost a child in the war. So they felt a connection to him. So he grew up in Kansas, but he was very connected uh, to the people of Texas. And here's the house was showing you the railroad tracks in the, in the 1970s. And so just imagine that all those trains coming by that close to the house and probably all that soot and smoke with the wind blowing it into the house. So that's the context of them living there. Probably would have had a picket fence, a different fence than what you see there. And then the neighborhood today, uh, you visit the site, you can see on the right, the Eisenhower Burr Place. Uh, on the left, we have the visitor center, which is an old house in the neighborhood. We have a museum there. And then Amanda is gonna come to you from the building called the Red Store. The Red Store was a general store built in 1890. We showed you all those railroad tracks. It was hard for people to get to the rest of town. So there were three uh, general stores within a couple of blocks of the birthplace house. And at the very top of the map, it says Crockett Avenue. Look ahead on top of the birthplace icon. And I think Ida's general store was right there. So very close. Well, for her doing her shopping and getting the things she needed. There's also a neat statue of Eisenhower that I'll show you here. Uh, so on the site, when you visit, we got the statue from 1973. It's one of five statues done by this guy in the center named uh, you know, Robert Dean. Robert Dean graduated from the US Military Academy in West Point in 1953. He marched in Eisenhower's inauguration parade. Pretty cool. He said years later, he wished he took a good look at the president. But we have that statue. The other statues that he did are in Kansas, West Point, New York, London, England, where his headquarters were in World War II, and Normandy, France, the scene of D-Day. And I just want to finish with a kind of a quick tour of the house. And so when you come in, you come into the parlor. And uh, if you visited them on a Sunday afternoon, this would be the room have the best furniture in it. Uh, people ask, is this their furniture? And I say, no, it wasn't. And if you visited in 1890, it probably wasn't their furniture either. They couldn't afford to bring all their things from Kansas. Uh, Ida had to leave a piano. She left her bread dough box in Kansas, which she didn't get back for many years. And so you see 1880s wallpaper. Now this furniture came, the people of Denison in North Texas donated a lot of the things that you see in here. So they're very proud of it. So we show it today as a working class environment. What was it like in 1890 in this house? Imagine the trains going by. And then here's the bedroom that Eisenhower was born in. People ask, well, how do you know that? Well, uh, basically Ida told us that, uh, you know, he was she was interviewed quite a bit in the 1940s. And so she confirmed that he was born in this house and in this room. Uh, according to her, the doctor didn't get there in time. So the doctor came in and found mom, baby, and a room full of neighbors, neighbor women who actually delivered Eisenhower in this tiny little room here. Denison was a happening place in 1890, had run, running water, electricity, uh, streetcars, but not this neighborhood, not yet. So you see a kerosene lamp on the, uh, next to the bed stand for light. On the other side, you'll see a wash basin for getting water from the well. So millions of Americans are born into settings like this, but so was our 34th president of the United States in this room. So mom and dad and probably baby Eisenhower uh, probably a drawer from the dresser was the crib. And then the dining room, remember I showed you that picture of Eisenhower and the big Texas breakfast? It was in this room, he was standing on to the left. In 1890, uh, this would have been a room that Ida was in with her children. 
when you visit today, you'll, you don't see the picture, but there's toys on the floor. So they would have been in here. She'd been in the kitchen or out on one of those porches, uh, spending her day cooking, working with the kids, doing those kind of labor chores. And her husband was gone for most of the time, uh, working six days a week. And then finally, we are in the uh, kitchen, the kitchen that I'm broadcasting to you from now. And so you see the gray walls, it's good. You got the big coal burning stove that's in there. And uh, we, we talk about this program about how Edgar Eisenhower wrote a memoir and he said, God only knows how mom fed the family and dad's meager salary. He didn't make very much money. How did she provide for them? Well, here's the clues in the kitchen. There's a bag of flour on the ground. So she'd buy flour in bulk and she'd make bread and bake goods. They say in Abilene, Kansas, she made nine loaves of bread every other day for the growing family. 27 loaves a week. Those kids ate lots of, uh, lots of loaves of bread. She had a garden outside that left window, kept chickens for eggs. Her view would have been through that window would have been to the sides of houses. Uh, she would have had friendships with the women that lived in this block. And they were the ones that came and helped her when, um, when she was delivering baby Eisenhower. The last thing I want to say about when I showed that picture of the family in Kansas is that when they were in Kansas, they had a garden. And then Ida and David really tried to get, give responsibility, a sense of, of responsibility to their children. So they divided the garden up and gave every, a little section to every one of the boys. And they were encouraged to grow what they wanted. And Eisenhower did research about, like, oh, sweet corn would, would sell really well. And he sold some of the things that he grew there while they were providing for the family. So uh, these food ways and what Amanda is going to show you is one of the recipes that Ida used to provide for the family. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to switch back here, but I just wanted to give you an overview of Eisenhower and the house and uh, kind of the, these three years that were challenging, but you know, again, Ida was very resource, resourceful in providing uh, food for her family. And now I'm going to turn it over to Amanda so she could... Uh, tell you more. John, before you do that, would you mind showing everyone just a quick view of the oven behind you and, and the kitchen that you're in? I know you showed the picture, but it might be kind of cool to just show the real thing right so this there. This is a coal burning stove that is in the kitchen and coal burning and they would have had coal. Uh, you know, Arthur, the oldest brother talked about walking with mom and picking coal off the railroad tracks. Probably dad David got coal from working in, uh, for the railroad. So can you just imagine that, <laughs> you know, when that was on, what it would feel like. There are lots of windows and doors in this space, for, both for ventilation and I think also fear of fire. So you imagine having all these windows open and uh, the doors open, <laughs> the train, the oven going and a train going by what that would have been like but this is yeah this is the oven that we have in the kitchen right now thank you over to you amanda all right so i'll take it away so we are making a recipe that was actually featured in the 1943 better homes and gardens magazine did an interview with ida eisenhower and she mentioned um fried corn mush. And some of you may be familiar with it and some of you might not. So uh, if you have any memories of it, I'd love for you to share those in that chat box so that way you know we can read them and enjoy them. Um, it's a very simple recipe. Basically you're working with water and you're working with cornmeal. And so what I've got here is I have three cups of water right now that are boiling. I have a cup of room temperature water and then I have one cup of cornmeal. Now, in her interview with Better Homes and Gardens, she mentions that she uses an iron kettle. We are using modern cooking implements and part of that is so that way you can actually recreate it at home. Um, but she mentioned that she would just boil water. She doesn't say how much and she would just stir in her coin, corn meal. She doesn't say how much, uh, which was pretty common. Uh, she would have done this so many times that she didn't need to have those measurements. She could eyeball it and be able to tell you exactly um, do you need to add more? Did you add too much? How long it needs to cook for? And she said she'd let it simmer for about three hours. If you're making it at home and you're making a cup like I am, 30 minutes will be perfectly fine. So the reason why I have this extra cup of water is because what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take my cornmeal and I'm actually gonna dump it in here 
because if you try to mix all of your cornmeal into the boiling water, it's gonna get really, really lumpy, which isn't too big of a deal, but if you want your mush to be a little bit smoother, you wanna go ahead and mix it. Now, if you are buying cornmeal to make this at home, I use my trusty Quaker oatmeal, oatmeal, cornmeal, oh my goodness. And you can tell what I eat for breakfast at home because it's definitely oatmeal. So I use Quaker cornmeal. You want to, if you're buying from a place that specializes in different grinds, you're gonna want a medium grind cornmeal. The coarser grinds are used for dishes like polenta and finer grinds, I wouldn't recommend using a grits grind for this. It's gonna come out a little bit different in the texture. Um, and this is very different from grits, from polenta. Uh, it has the same base ingredients of just water and cornmeal, but it, the end product is not gonna be the same. You can eat this when it's done cooking. You can eat it straight out of the pot if you want to. And I'm sure that uh, some of you may have even eaten it straight out of the pot. But what Ida preferred to do was she would make the large batch and then pour it into various pans and let it sit because she would actually use it for primarily breakfast and she'd fry it. Or there were accounts from the boys of their father, David, getting up early, slicing the mush fresh and frying it up. So I've almost got a boil on my water. If you saw me during the, uh, when John was talking, I was slowly adjusting it to try and get it to be boiling. Um, you can do this in bigger quantities. I use a four to one ratio, four cups of water, one cup of cornmeal. There are some recipes out there that you can find that use three. I prefer four. I think it turns out uh, a lot smoother. Now, John did mention that uh, the boys helped out and that there were gardens in Kansas that they would grow items like corn to sell. And another thing they learned was actually how to cook. All the boys took turns cooking, especially as they got older. I did, since she didn't have any girls, there wasn't anyone to really help out with that. So the boys chipped in. Uh, she said Ike was actually one of the better boys at cooking and that he really enjoyed it. Uh, and his, one of his favorite things to cook was actually pies. And uh, she said she could absolutely trust him in the kitchen and she knew that the meals would uh, come out looking good. All right, so our water here has enough of a boil going to it. So we're just gonna add this in. Make sure to scrape all of it out of our copper bowl. And you're just gonna stir until this is fully incorporated. As soon as all of your cornmeal is incorporated and it's looking a bit like a slurry, you're actually going to crank the heat all the way down to low and you're gonna let it simmer. You do not need to cover it. Uh, we want to try and let that moisture escape. So right after you add the water, it almost looks like if you've ever had anyone make really runny instant mashed potatoes, that's about what it's going to look like. So now I'm going to crank it down. You can hear it popping to low and we're going to let that sit. And as I mentioned before, you're going to let this sit for about 30 minutes. You can stir it occasionally, but what we're trying to do is right now we have something that's extremely soupy and we want it to thicken up. So we're just gonna let this thicken for a bit. But with the magic of the fact that I've prepped some stuff early, I actually poured some in a loaf pan last night. So this has been sitting out on the counter for several hours and then you can actually put this in your refrigerator to make it solidify faster. Be careful when you're covering this because we spend a lot of time boiling and trying to get um, excess moisture out. We don't wanna trap it back in here because what's gonna happen is your mush is gonna get too soft. If you wanna store this for long periods of time, you can just leave it in your fridge. I'd have probably left it on our counter. Absolutely do not freeze it. It does not freeze well. What happens is the moisture and the cornmeal actually separate from each other. So again, you're gonna end up with crumbly mush and nobody likes that. How you're gonna know it's done is I have a piece in here that's sliced. So I can literally just pick it up with my fingers. And this is about what it looks like. 
Now, she doesn't mention preferences for how the boys like to have their mush cut. Some modern recipes will tell you quarter inch. Some modern recipes will tell you half inch. It just depends on personal preference. If you want crispier mush, cut it extremely thin and then fry it. You're gonna get a nice crisp. If you like that uh, sort of gooey texture, you're going to want those thicker half inch slices because it's gonna get nice and warm in the center, but it's gonna be crispy on the outside. So what I'm gonna do is while this is simmering, I'm going to turn on my other burner over here and we're going to start frying. And according to Ida, you can use whatever you want that you have at home to grease your pan, whether you've got butter or lard or uh, a fan favorite is bacon grease, any sort of meat grease that you're cooking with. Because that cornmeal mush is actually going to pick up the flavor from that bacon grease. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start greasing our pan. I just have my stick of butter here that I'm using. That is my preference. And get that nice and greased and wait for that heat to rise. And again, if you have any questions about anything that I'm doing here or the history of anything, please pop those questions in the chat box, let me know. Now, I don't know how many of you would, would want to eat this plain. It doesn't taste bad. Um, tastes better with a little bit of butter on it. But Ida does mention two specific toppings. The, of course, the fan favorite for most of the boys was either uh, some form of syrup, whether it was corn syrup, maple syrup. I happen to have some maple syrup here or brown sugar. But Ike in particular liked uh, a dish that was inspired uh, by David's Pennsylvania Dutch heritage, and it's what Ida called puddin. Now pudding, definitely don't want to get those two things mixed up. Puddin is a meat concoction, and as she put it, it was a great way to make meat scraps go even further. So what she would do is take ham hocks or leftover odds and ends of meats that she had laying around the house, you pop them in a crock, uh, you boil them for about three hours. Everything in this interview, the mush, the pudding, it was all about three hours, but she's making food for a family of eight. So she probably had to make it in large quantities. So what you would do is once that had been boiled and everything was nice and soft, you would then take it and she recommended a double grinding. So bones, everything, you put it in a grinder, you grind it up and it's gonna make this almost gelatinous consistency. Drain the grease off, put it back in the pot, add water to it, let it boil. And basically what you're making is this uh, thicker meat gravy, which she said could last forever. You would store it and you would let the grease rise to the top and cover it. It would make a nice seal. If you wanted more pudding, you would just crack the seal on it, take it out, spread it on top of your mush, or toast or whatever you happen to be eating. But apparently that was Ike's favorite way to have his fried cornmeal mush. So I'm actually going to do a second slice. As I said, you'll know that it's done well if you can pick it up. This piece in my hand now just tore, but smaller pieces aren't necessarily a bad thing. If this is too fragile, if you can't actually pick it up when you're after you're done, all it means is that there was a little bit too much uh, water and it needed to sit a little bit longer. This recipe was great because Ida could make it in large quantities and as the boys got older, they could make their own breakfast in the morning. If you look at the caloric intake and the energy it's gonna give you, it's fairly low, but what it's gonna do is it's what a lot of people call the, it's the stuff that really sticks to your ribs. It keeps you full for a very long time, especially if you're eating it with the pudding on top, which according to, I believe it was Edgar said that they usually did pudding in the winter because you could warm it up and it'd be nice and warm. So we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at our mush that we have here on the burner. And as you can see, it's starting to thicken up. So we're getting a consistency of about thickened oatmeal. That means that we're actually doing really good. Um, if you've ever left oatmeal or anything sitting and it gets that kind of 
congealed thing where you can basically pick it up like a block. That's what we're going for with this. It doesn't sound the most appetizing, but after it sits, as I showed you in my loaf pan, it actually looks really, really pretty. And I have tried this before. It doesn't taste too bad. Um, as I said, without the topping, it doesn't have too much of a flavor. It tastes like corn, but it's a nice warm breakfast. And so this dish has always been interesting to me. One, because I never heard of it before I worked here. Um, I've heard of grits. I've heard of polenta. Um, I've seen those things, but never fried corn mush. It's an interesting unity of Ida Eisenhower and David Eisenhower, because that pudding is from his side of the family. Whereas fried corn mush, we do see that being eaten in the Virginia area and actually uh, one of the, I believe it's the West Virginia Department of Agriculture even puts out their own fried corn mush recipe. Um, you can even see this dish being eaten in the Ohio area, uh, the Michigan area. So corn dishes, this one included, have been around for so long and are such, corn is such an important part of many people's diets. And so what you're hoping for when you're frying it is a nice golden brown texture. And I will be able to show you guys a little bit uh, closer once we get more fry on. Uh, but Anjali, if you want, if there are any questions about especially the cooking process that have popped up in the chat, let me know while I'm waiting on this to fry and I can go ahead and start answering some of those. Absolutely, Amanda. Um, I, uh, Pamela Weems uh, asks about a written copy of the recipe. Yes, Pamela, we will send out an email after this event with a link um, to the presentation and the recipe as well. So yeah, you will get that. Um, I was actually uh, intrigued by what you were just saying, Pamela uh, and uh, Amanda, about mm -hmm. the fact that the calorific value of this, this meal was not that high, uh, but it made you feel full. And that kind of relates to the fact that this was a working class family. They did not have a whole lot of money for fancy food, um, but you know, and they had to feed so many people that this was what people ate. Um, it didn't cost as much as some of the other stuff. Um, so that, that was kind of interesting. You know, it, it gives you an insight into, um, into how, um, you know, uh, President Eisenhower and his family, how they grew up. You know, they, this was truly, truly a, blue collar family with, um, you know, with not a whole lot of means that, that they were taking care of, you know, all their children and making sure that they were fed and um, all of that. So that, that was kind of interesting um, what, what you shared about that. Definitely. And it also takes to point out the fact that a lot of what she's saying, it takes a while to cook. That pudding took three hours. This took three hours. Cause you know, when she says a, a lot, a large iron pot, it's, it's large. Um, the whole purpose of it is because you can store this stuff. Like I said, this has been sitting on my counter. I made a test batch earlier on because you always got to make a test batch. Um, and it was in my refrigerator for over a week. Um, it's a lot for me to eat as one person, but she had so, so many kids to feed. And especially as they're growing up, they're going to need a lot of that really filling food. And especially if her husband went to work, David would need to eat something that's gonna get him through to uh, potentially his lunchtime and everything that could be stored. We mentioned uh, maple syrup that lives, you, you know, you got that bottle that's in the back of your pantry that's been there forever. Uh, cornmeal when it's not cooked stores for such a long time. So it's very important to consider the fact that she's looking long-term at these meals. That, that's a great point. Uh, Linda Lane uh, suggests, she says, I'd probably add a flavorful cheese like Parmesan to give it a more savory flavor. I was actually wondering about that too. I mean, if I were to cook this, I would want to add different things to the, to the mush itself and, and then cool it so that when you, when you fry it for breakfast or something, you can either make it savory or you can make it sweet. It really Definitely. depends. Yeah, and I would love to see that. I know we see cheese in a few dishes, um, especially as toppings and things. And I know for them that savory would come in with that pudding, which again, it seemed to have been Ike's favorite. Of course, the other boys wanted that really, really uh, sweet breakfast. 
But in some cases, they d- would mention that, especially if they had bacon or something that they would have fried, it does pick up that savory taste if you use that leftover grease. And of course, waste not, want not, if you fried bacon, you're frying your mush in that right afterwards. So we're definitely, uh, this dish is extremely versatile and I would love to try it with cheese. And I may be taking my loaf home and putting cheese on it tonight. I'm just saying. Perfect. So we're starting to get brown. I haven't let it get to the nice dark golden brown um, that you normally could, but that's because it gets fairly crispy because I can actually cut it now. But you see, I've made these slices thicker, so it's going to stay a little bit softer in the middle, which is fine. It gets nice and warm and toasty. Uh, I can imagine that for some, this would have been a comfort food because it is, it's warm. It's something that you're eating with your family. And so we're seeing, it was funny because my, one of my coworkers, when I was first describing this, and that's why I made the clarification about uh, polenta and grits and things. It's because she, she literally thought I was making grits. She was like, are you just making grits? I said, no, I'm not making grits. I'm actually making something entirely different, but it goes to show you that a lot of people relied on corn as a, a form of sustenance. So it is that medium grind. It has a different texture and the fact that you actually let it solidify. And while you can eat it straight out of the pot, like what we're cooking here, you're primarily going to fry it and eat it that way, especially um, that's mainly how Ida described it is that's something that she would make and then set aside to be eaten later. Um, so all you got to do, if you want, you can even add some, if you have some extra butter laying at home, you can do that. And you just pour some syrup over top of it. You got a nice looking plate. Mine looks a little bit sad, uh, cause some of my pieces came apart while I was frying them. But this is something simple that you can make at home. Some of you may even have the ingredients at home cause you probably got some syrup and, or some, um, brown sugar sitting at home, some cornmeal stashed away somewhere that maybe you're thinking, oh, I want to try something different with it. I definitely recommend giving this a shot. Um, it's an interesting recipe. And if you've never tried it, it is an interesting flavor. Uh, and then to just show you, because it's probably been about 10 or so minutes. So we're starting to get thicker and that's a good thing. So most of this moisture has come out and we're left with this. So this would get spooned into our loaf pan or whatever you want to store it in. The thicker you make this, the smaller you want to cut it and uh, the longer you're going to want to let it sit. This was probably solid in about five or six hours and it was ready to be sliced and eaten. Um, of course, that was at like 10 o'clock at night. So I waited until our presentation today. Um, so Linda also says cooked apples would be a great sweet addition. Absolutely. Uh, oh, Bonnie yeah. McKee. Hi, Bonnie. Um, Bonnie um, is sharing a comment. She says, thanks for a very interesting program. One of my grandmothers actually made this, and I have a dim memory of having that for breakfast with her homemade sugar syrup. Is there any information that Ida would, uh, about Ida, Ida making her own syrup? Um, and she says, I have no memory of the process, but recall her cast iron Dutch oven, always cooking a hot cereal for the big breakfast meals. So as far as I know, Ida did not make her own syrups. Um, to be fair, Ida did not leave a lot of the recipes behind. Um, she, like many people of that time, made it every day, made it so often that we have it. And I don't think, John, we don't know anything about her making her own, do we? I have not seen it come across in any of the recipes. Um, but she was a big fan of teaching her children how to cook. I don't think Ike ever made it either, but he did. At one point he commented in um, the book At Ease uh, that he felt like sometimes they, the news was covering more of him cooking than him doing other things. Cause we'd be like, oh, he is uh, barbecuing or boiling fish or doing these things and here are the recipes. So we actually have uh, quite a few uh, Ike was from what most people said, a wonderful cook. I mean, his mom even said that one of the better ones for the boys. So if anyone was gonna offer to cook something, if it was Ike, she was taking him up on that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, since John is there, um, I, I wanted to ask if, if 
uh, you or John could share the story that I know Kitty and I've heard about um, Ike and his brother, and, and I'm forgetting which brother, um, but how they, when they were going to college, how they kind of split their time and switched back and forth about who was who was going to attend college, or I think it was college, uh, who was going to attend and who was going to work to pay for for the other person. Could you share that story too, John? We can't see your head, John, so you may want to. There you go. <laughs> there you uh, go. So as I talked about, and I showed that picture of the family, that education was very important uh, to Eisenhower and his brothers. And I always ask the question, who do you think lit a fire under those guys to get their education and pick a career path and stick with it? And I definitely think it's mom. I think, I think it was Ida who encouraged them. But uh, Eisenhower, when he got out of high school, he wanted to go to college. So uh, he made a deal of his brother Edgar, so the second oldest son, uh, that he would work at the creamery where his father worked and send the money to Edgar to get a couple years of school. And then when Edgar got out, he was uh, going to well, do two years and Edgar was going to work and pay for Dwight's education. Well, Dwight is working at the creamery. A friend of his tells him about the service academies, the Navy Academy, the Mil West, West Point Military Academy. If you get in there, the government will pay for your education. So he thought, well, great, that's what I want to do. I want to go to Annapolis, the Naval Academy. Uh, by the time he gets through his uh, examinations, he gets appointed to West Point. And when I showed you that picture in the dining room, keep in mind that he was a five-star general, chief of staff of the Army, top guy in the Army. So you just never know how life turns out. But I think it's from mom and dad really instilling the importance of getting an education for, uh, to, their, to their son. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, any other stories that you have? Because I, I know when Katie and I have visited the site multiple times, we've heard a lot of stories. And it's so much fun to, to understand more deeply, I think, you know, the, the people that we look up to as our leaders, um, you know, to understand them more personally as, as human beings, as family people. So any other stories that you have to share? I'm yeah, trying to yeah. remember what, what else. Uh, well, one of the things that, that was really interesting, standing at that birthplace house and looking at how far, which is it, probably, what, 20 feet away is the, is the, the place where the, the railroad tracks would have been, um, to, to understand how, as, the, as the, the trains went by, all of that soot and everything would come into the house. And I'm sure Ida spent a whole lot of time cleaning as well, just because of, you know... Um, and, and I know because of that, she had all her washing stuff set set up behind the house as opposed to on the side or anything, just probably because that shielded some of that, you know, soot from coming and attacking, attaching itself to the clothes and things like that. Definitely, she would have hung her laundry up on the other side of the house away from the railroad track. And the, the railroad tracks run at a diagonal. So, I mean, the railroad, the tracks were in front of the house, and then in the back of the kitchen, you could see the railroad tracks as well. So, definitely, she would have hung things out back there. I think about that kitchen. I said how small it was, if the oven was going, the trains were coming by. You know, uh, the, the advent of, of window screens, that's really something from about 1900. So, I'm thinking about we don't have, like, bug screens. <laughs> you know, just trying to think about not, not a place... I'd want to spend a lot of time in, but I mean, she definitely, she had, had to do that and provide for her family. So yes, I mean, you have said that she had a good spirit, good attitude. You'd have to in a situation where you couldn't keep things clean constantly and you, you have all this stuff happening. I mean, I think she had a good, a good attitude for the situation that they were, they were in. Could you also share a little bit about the neighborhood itself? I know you, you mentioned that it, this was a working class neighborhood for Denison, um, given given that you know Denison was thriving at that time as a boom town, what what who were the people that were living there, and what happened to the neighborhood over the years? So the neighborhood starts off. It was a lot of railroad people. So I showed you a page from the city directory. So we know who was living here in 1890 in the houses. We have fire insurance maps that show us where the houses were. So we know in the neighborhood we had conductors, we had engineers. We had uh, teamsters and laborers. Uh, actually, the, 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 there was a mixed ethnic nature of the neighborhood. Uh, there were some African-American families that lived in other parts of it. So again, these are all working class near the, the rail yards. 
So you didn't have that kind of segregation. So there was a guy named Isaac Sims. The paper says he, uh, the directory said his name was Ike Sims. And he lived uh, across the street and just a few doors down. Uh, so a lot of, lot of laborers, as, as the neighborhood goes on, it become more uh, laborers and unskilled laborers versus what it was in the beginning. Uh, but the neighborhood, those rail yards were there active until through the 1920s. That's when the Katy Railroad moved some of its functions to Waco. And then there was less of a dependence on, you know, the railroad was still important, but there was a less of a dependence on it for, for that neighborhood. Uh, but that neighborhood continued to be kind of isolated, didn't get paved streets until the 1960s. And, you know, uh, different story than the rest of town, very much tied to the railroad. Anjali, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. I, I was on mute. Uh, I was I was saying that, and and now the city of Denison is um, in its uh, main street planning process is is actively looking at tying the site to uh, to that that main street plan as well. Correct. Yes, I mean we are just a couple blocks away from what's the main street district, Denison's historic district. Uh, just two blocks away from us, there's a kind of series of tunnels where the railroads go over and that connects us to the downtown. They are doing a new design uh, streetscape project, which has actually started. And they are doing that. And then part of that is eventually building extra connections to get to us, to make it easier to walk or to bike down to us. So it's great that we're working with you to do improvements within the site. And the city of Denison is supporting us outside the site to build those connections. Uh, the people of Denison and North Texas, they're very proud of the birthplace. I mean, there's a lot of signage. There is a veterans monument, which is a bust of General Eisenhower on the 75 highway, which you, you see as you go up to Oklahoma. So great community support for what we're doing here. And we definitely appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I, I just wanted to remind um, our uh, participants, please feel free to drop a question in the chat box if you have one, or, um, or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. In the meantime, um, John, I was wondering if you could share just a little bit about the capital improvements that we have planned for the site and what we're trying to do there. Certainly, so we have a campaign of about $2.2 million, uh, with, which would be in three different phases. So it's a series of improvements. Uh, one improvement to change the entrance to the site to a street that's easier to get in. I showed you a picture of the statue. We we're gonna build a new statue plaza that would be in this very center uh, of the site. We need to build uh, uh, new pathways and uh, accessibility options to get you from one end of the site to another. I mentioned that we wanted to build what we're calling lost neighborhood footprints. So outlines of these houses that I talked about that we know where they were and we actually know who was living in them in 1890, rebuild a section of track. And then there would also be uh, exhibit improvements, a new exhibit in the visitor center, uh, some exhibits and uh, it, within the birthplace house. So it's a whole series of things that make it easier to find the birthplace to understand the context of it, that it was a neighborhood. So you'll see outlines of houses. So you, so you can understand more about what the family life was like and how this influenced Dwight Eisenhower. Thank you. Um, Nancy says, this has been very interesting. She remembers her grandmother making this, this dish. And um, she, her grandmother also made a meat dish she called a scrapple. So that's, that's, maybe you know about it, Amanda. I do. Scrapple is super similar to cornmeal mush. So Scrapple is um, similar to a Pennsylvania Dutch and it might be influenced um, in her grandmother's case by Pennsylvania Dutch called Pond House, which is a rabbit house. And what you do is use cornmeal, but instead of using water, you're going to use um, something similar to that pudding. It's um, almost like a, a gravy along with chunks of meat in there as well. So it's going to be a bit of a heartier dish. Uh, versus the cornmeal mush and have that savory flavor to it. It's interesting you mentioned that because one of the things that, and I've said this before too, I come from India, from North India, Kashmir, 
um, which you know was was is is cold a good part of the year. And we have something similar, but we use rice instead. So we make a gravy with meat and stuff like that, and and really tripe. It's not so you know. It's again, it, it's a it's a poor man's dish. We use tripe and make a gravy, and then put rice into it and cook it for a good long time so it becomes mushy like that and you eat it like a soft kind of like a like a risotto but you know a, a poor man's risotto um so food connects us across the world really um amanda are there any educational programs that you'd like to share information about um with with our attendees so so that they can maybe think about visiting Sure. Um, so, of course, people are welcome to come and uh, self-guide through the birthplace house. We're taking um, reservations. If you know that you're going to be near the Denison area and you want to get in there as well as our exhibits, just give us a call. We'll get you on um, to be able to self-guide through that. And then I'm also hosting um, children's summer programs. Um, I believe we have a flyer on our Facebook page that goes into dates and times, everything from uh, gardening programs where I take them up to our 1890s garden and we plant um, some seeds to take home to um, working with uh, Girl Scouts and doing some Girl Scouts programming. And of course, anybody who wants to can give us a follow on Facebook. And that's usually where I update all of our upcoming programs. I'm already looking at the schedule for fall and getting some really cool stuff in the work. Um, around October and into uh, December because we usually do a holiday program, which is always a lot of fun. So if you're looking and you're going to be visiting around then, keep your eyes peeled and give us a follow on Facebook. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Amanda, John, for um, for joining us this afternoon. It, it's a Saturday and, and uh, I know it's it's personal time that you've taken to, to be with us. We really, really appreciate it. And for all of you joining us today, thank you so much um, for being part of this, this event. And um, please continue um, to, to sign up and register for future events. As I mentioned, we have our next event on July 15th from Fort Griffin State Historic Site. Um, we will be uh, taking you to meet the official Texas Longhorn Herd. That should be kind of a fun, fun event as well. Um, I know I have learned a lot today, John, even though we've been coming to the site and talking to you about um, Eisenhower and, and uh, the stories that you, you have to share. I learned something new today. So um, thank you for that. And um, uh, for our attendees, we will be sending out a link to the Facebook Live um, uh, event that, that you can share with your friends if you'd like or watch again. And we will send the recipe that uh, Amanda has shared with us. Um, and uh, hope you have a rest, uh, a good rest of the uh, weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you.